Hi everyone. Again, <laughs> we were having a little chit chat before uh, recording, but uh, thank you so much for joining us in this journal club session, uh, part of Race Against the Clock and Valley DAO. So um, just for you joining us for the first time, likely, or, or repeating uh, in this journal club session that we're organizing, um, Race Against the Clock is part of Team Beta. Team Beta is uh, one of the world play premier networks of synthetic biology worldwide, where uh, we organize the annual synthetic biology conference in the Bay Area every year. And we attract entrepreneurs, scientists, investors, industry leaders, also government leaders, and a lot of young people motivated to contribute to the bioeconomy. So in order to facilitate these uh, networking opportunities to more young people like, like you joining us today, uh, we create the Race Against the Clock program, which basically what it does is to um, help you connect with other like-minded people that want to jump into the bioeconomy. It could be as a startup founder or just find your next place in your career development. Uh, we have a lot of academics as well, uh, which are you know helping us to create this inclusive and vibrant community. But what we're very focused is to help them to connect in a very high level um, uh, setting. So uh, this past year, we host the first Race Science the Clock Summit where we have around 500 racers coming to the Bay Area to, to join us in this big celebration that Symbiobeta organize every year. And, um, and some of you in the audience had the opportunity to join us in Oakland in April uh, this year. And since then, it's been very, very gratifying to see how new friendships are coming and, and how people are still like very excited to learn more about synthetic biology, bioengineering, and, 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 and find ways to potentially apply these concepts to the real world. So um, with that said, I'm going to pass now the mic to Sarah, where she's going to introduce Bali Dao and our amazing guest speaker, uh, Ardennes. So Sarah, the mic is yours. Great. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm representing Bali Dao. And as some of you probably know, uh, we are a, an open, decentralized science community. Um, the primary focus is uh, we fund at both academic and non-academic research projects. And we, we want to find ways of making the IP generated um, more accessible and these technologies sort of more accessible to um, community members and to the wider public, whether that's, you know, bio, bio, other bio founders, industry or researchers. And uh, we sort of have a very community uh, driven and sort of community decision making system at place. Um, so this is sort of what we do as part of the community. Uh, and of course, we well, you know, co-host this journal club to sort of spread this very, very interesting science that's going on. Um, and part of our mission is centered on how biomanufacturing can aid um, sort of the longevity of the planet and extend its lifespan and also, you know, make it a more livable place for people. So, of course, one of the big issues is um, creating energy systems that are sort of abundant, and that we can, you know, we can generate from sort of organic life, um, which is why uh, we have chosen um, Artemis Bogosian, a, a tenured professor at the EPFL, um, who will talk to us about um, sort of enhancing bioelectricity generation in cyanobacteria. So Artemis, thank you so much for being here and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction and the wonderful overview of what inspires some of the work that's coming out of our lab. Um, I have some slides to share. So we'll, the key is to kind of uh, discuss a bit, go into more detail about this paper that uh, some of you may have read. Uh, before I go into the paper, just to give you a brief overview of my lab and what we do, I have two, three slides to, to put that into perspective where we're coming from. Uh, so the paper focuses on using living photovoltaics on nanobionic, used from nanobionic cells that power them. Uh, but just to give you background on where this kind of research comes from. So 
I'm very fortunate. I, so I have a lab, as mentioned, at EPFL, and we're very, um, I have researchers uh, that come from many difficult, uh, different areas of research. It's, we have aerospace engineers working side by side with biologists, chemists, physicists. We even have food scientists in our lab. So together, this is a very anti-disciplinary team of researchers. And what our goal is, is actually to try to tackle problems that you cannot tackle just solving using one discipline, just using bio biology or just using uh, chemistry. So this brave team of researchers uh, formed the Laboratory of Nanobiotechnology here at um, EPFL. And so the question is, why are we interested in nanobiotechnology? Um, of course, it sounds like a wonderful buzzword, but there's actually a logic behind this nanobio interface. In particular, if you look at nanotechnology and the advantages it has, so nanotechnology, you can control the properties of a material by controlling the mechanics, by controlling the structure. There's a known structure function relationship. Nanomaterials have tunable band gaps. They have fluorescence properties that are real ideal. But the disadvantage of nanotechnology is that usually you cannot control the interactions very well. They're not very selective. It tends to be very expensive, especially if you want to fabricate nanotechnology at a large scale. And so you're usually limited to small scale manufacturing. But the disadvantages that you have with nanotechnology is actually exactly the advantages you have with biomaterials. Biomaterials, you could, draw, you could uh, grow bacteria in giant buckets. Um, it's cheap. And in molecular recognition, there's no material better than biomaterials. Proteins have very specific interactions. They can tell the difference between two of the same molecules that just have small differences in chirality. In large scale manufacturing, material availability is not an issue. And the disadvantages of biomaterials, which is usually protein instability or photo bleaching, are actually the advantages that you get with nanomaterials. So the reason why we work at the nanobiotechnology interface is, can we overcome the limitations of each of these fields by coupling their advantages precisely because the advantages are highly complementary in these areas. And so when you're looking at biology, really all the magic happens at the nanoscale, these protein interactions. So when you have power control over what happens at the nanoscale, you have a lot of control over the biology of your system. And so in our lab, the main kinds of applications we focus on, we focus mostly on optical applications that exploit the synergy between artificial and natural materials. And the two main optical applications in our lab are optical biosensing, for usually for biomedical applications, as well as light harvesting bioenergy. So the paper that you've uh, read is actually more focused on the latter application relating to light harvesting bioenergy. So this talk is going to be focused more on that area of research in my lab. So in particular, the light harvesting bioenergy, we get our inspiration from nature. Um, usually when you think of solar cells, you think of these silicon devices that are on the rooftops, but there's a, a dirty secret with the photovoltaic community. And it's actually among all the renewable energy sources, a lot of CO2 is actually released just to make the solar cell. And when I heard this piece of information as, as a student, I was very surprised because I thought, well, here we have plants that can also harness solar energy and they're not releasing CO2. Actually, they actively sequester CO2. And so that's the inspiration behind using a living material, using photosynthesis as your photovoltaic, because now you could harness solar energy and instead of releasing CO2, you're actually sequestering the CO2 to make more of the material. And there's also an intricacy. There's an art behind using something that's alive. These materials, they're dynamic. They could control the amount of light that they achieve depending on the influence. They have these modular systems. They're self-repairing. Whenever they get damaged, they know how to repair themselves. You don't have to send a repair person on a rooftop to fix this microbe. And in reality, these cells are actually a material scientist's dream. They're self-replicating. You don't have a factory creating each individual microbe. They replicate themselves. So if you want to talk material scientists and cost, this is really excellent um, advantages to have. And in particular, when we're talking about photosynthesis, we're especially interested in bacteria that do photosynthesis. Bacteria is everywhere. It's on the uh, computer screen that you're staring at right now. So doesn't it make sense that we should create a photovoltaic based on an organism that loves covering surfaces? And so this is the inspiration behind creating a living photovoltaic. So this is an artist rendition of what we want to do. So light goes in, you have some sort of microbe and we want to get electricity out. And of course, as 
eager scientists and researchers. We want to know what's going on inside of the cell. The art is trying to get this electricity out of the cell. So in my group, we have three different approaches to try to engineer this bioelectricity generation. One approach is a synthetic biology approach, so bioengineering. So we express foreign proteins that efficiently allow electrons to go out of the cell. We also do nanomaterials engineering approach where we engineer electrodes that can effectively interface with the bacteria to take out as many electrons as possible. And the third approach, which is the approach that I'll be focusing on in this talk, is nanobionic approach. So the idea behind nanobionics is that there is no interface between the living cell and the electrode. The electrode is a living cell and the living cell is the electrode. Can we somehow infuse artificial um, materials or embed them inside of a living system so that this interface is really intimate. You can't tell where the electrode begins and where the cell ends. And so this is the inspiration behind nanobionics is having infusing these um, living cells with artificial capabilities, artificial materials that allow them to, for example, have enhanced properties such as increased electricity generation. So in our lab, the type of nanomaterials that we're especially interested in is single walled carbon nanotubes. Um, why are we interested in using single walled carbon nanotubes in cyanobacteria? So there's actually many reasons why beyond bioelectricity generation. The biggest advantage is carbon nanotubes, they give off fluorescence that's very different from visible fluorescence. So when you look at cyanobacteria and most photosynthetic organisms, they give off light in the visible range between 400 and 700 nanometers. And nanotubes, the type of light they give off is between 1000 and 1400 nanometers. So it's very red. So what this means is that it's very easy for us to see the nanotubes inside of the cell because it does not interfere. The background of the cell is in a, at very different wavelengths of light, so it does not interfere with the carbon nanotubes. In addition, another reason why we want to get nanotubes in cyanobacteria is just because it's really hard to get things in cyanobacteria. Um, most prokaryotes, such as E. coli, they have an outer membrane, they have a cytoplasmic membrane, they also have a peptidoglycan membrane. The cyanobacteria have an additional layer, which is a serrated external layer that makes it very difficult to get things in and out. So if we could engineer something that can go inside the cyanobacteria, this is interesting not only for energy applications, but also other delivery applications. Uh, another reason why we're interested to getting nanotubes inside of cyanobacteria is actually getting DNA inside. So that's one of the materials we're interested to get in. So most of the time, if you've had experience working with E. coli in the lab, um, it's relatively easy, considered relatively easy to get DNA inside. There's several techniques. They do electroporation or you could use chemical poration to get DNA and make these artificial um, to be able to introduce, a, for example, express a foreign protein inside of E. coli. Cyanobacteria, it's a bit trickier. So though, though there are some cyanobacteria strains that can naturally take up DNA, the majority of them require a complex procedure called triparental mating, where you have the plasmid that your, your donor strain that has a plasmid that you're actually interested in getting inside. We also have an additional plasmid called a helper, helper plasmid. And you also have a conjugative strain. And then you have to have multiple cells kind of conjugate in order to get all three plasmids inside to finally get the DNA that you want inside of the cell. So, this is a very inefficient process. You get low yields. Um, and so, so far, carbon nanotubes have been used to get DNA inside of plants and chloroplasts. And so the idea is, can we do it in something where there's much thicker barrier to getting DNA inside, such as cyanobacteria, to make bioengineering a bit easier? So in addition to these advantages, another prospect of using nanotubes and putting them inside the cyanobacteria is bioelectricity generation. So beyond just imaging and beyond just doing delivery of DNA and getting cargo inside, can we use nanotubes to also enhance bioelectricity? And the properties show some promise to be able to do this. So first, carbon nanotubes, they absorb light across many wavelengths um, from the UV to the near infrared. So this increased light absorption could contribute to increased photovoltaic performance. Nanotubes are semiconducting, but they could also come in with metallic conductivity. So the metallic nanotubes could act as electron conduits for shuttling electrons out of the cell. In addition, the semiconducting nanotubes give off near-infrared fluorescence. So as I mentioned, the near-infrared fluorescence makes it very easy to track the nanotubes inside the cell. So you could see not only if they're going inside, but where they are going inside of the cell. Now, one of the tricky pro aspects of this project was trying to image the nanotubes inside of the cells. So most um, biological labs, they use uh, confocal microscopes that work in the visible range. 
The problem is these nanotubes emit in the near infrared. And so we had to build a special setup to be able to image confocal nanotubes in the near infrared range. And this was actually my first PhD student built this setup. It's the first of its kind. It's a custom built spinning disc confocal microscope that could image near infrared fluorescence. So we could see near infrared nanotubes inside of the cell. And here's a comparison. So the state of the art is a wild, wide field image. So this is seeing all the light coming from the cell. So both outside the cell and inside the cell. And this is a confocal image where we could see the, the nanotube fluorescence just inside of the cell. And you could see that you get much higher resolution. You could see the heterogeneity of the nanotube inside of the cell using the setup. So I skipped a bit ahead, but getting the nanotubes inside of the cell was not an easy thing. Um, so this was a, an endeavor taken up by Alessandra Antonucci, a former PhD student in my lab. And initially she tried to get nanotubes inside of the cell using DNA wrapped nanotubes. So the reason why we tried this as our first approach was because this has been shown in the literature to go inside a chloroplast. And we figured chloroplast, cyanobacteria, eh, they're pretty much the same thing. If it works in chloroplast, maybe it'll work in cyanobacteria. Wrong. Unfortunately, it turned out um, the cell autofluorescence, you can see here in green, we did not see any nanotube fluorescence. So although it worked in chloroplast, we ha didn't have as much luck with the cyanobacteria. So then Alessandra tried Kaidazen. We had the same problem. We could not see any nanotubes go inside. And I'm embarrassed to say, but we tried many other things. And actually I had given up and had asked Alessandra. So this is to give you some insight on, on kind of the dynamics of a PhD thesis. I said, okay, we should probably change directions of our thesis. And she had agreed. And then two weeks later, she shows up to my office and mentioned, I know you said that we should change directions, but I tried one more thing. And she showed me this, it was a beautiful data set. She managed to get the nanotubes inside uh, using light design wrap nanotubes. So just when I had given up, um, the dark horse project worked out well. So this is a dark horse project because it's usually a project that a PhD student does when the, that the professor does only knows about if it works out well. And using light design wrap nanotubes, she was able to get the nanotubes inside. And so we looked at all the wrappings and we actually found several other wrappings that worked, polyarginine and histone. And we noticed a trend. We found that when we wrapped the nanotubes with strongly positive charge, shown here in green, uh, these positively charged wrappings go inside the cell. But the ones that did not have the strong positive charge, shown here in red, did not. So this gave us insight that maybe the wrapping charge plays a critical role to getting nanotubes inside of the cell. So in addition, we looked at how, what else can we do to control the cell uptake? We looked at the length effect. So here on the left, or AFM images. So we looked at, we compared the uptake of short nanotubes shown above and longer nanotubes you can see as, as the AFM images shown below. And interestingly, if you look at the corresponding fluorescence image, the short nanotubes have a much higher fluorescence localization in the cell compared to the longer nanotubes, even though actually the shorter nanotubes have a lower quantum efficiency. So they're usually less bright per nanotube. And so this means that we're actually getting more localization, more the shorter nanotubes are more readily taken up by the cell than the longer nanotubes. And this is actually in agreement with what has already been um, mentioned in the literature and has been observed with mammalian cells, shown here on the right. So if we take actually, if we go back and we look very closely at this image, so what's nice about the confocal image is we get this high resolution image, but we see that this ring around each cell and we were concerned. We asked ourselves, how do we know that the nanotubes are actually going inside of the cell instead of just sitting outside of the cell or just sitting in the periplasmic region? So this is uh, in the peer review process. This was where we had to do extensive experimentation to prove that the nanotubes were actually going inside. And this data on the paper is what specifically addresses this point. How do we know the nanotubes are inside of the cell? So we did many techniques. Uh, one of them is we looked at fluorescence tracking. So we looked at the nanotubes going inside of the cell over time and looked at the fluorescence increase at the periphery and compared it to the fluorescence increase at the center. We also did additional measurements, which I'll be discussing later with um, ferrous cyanide and TEM and Raman spectroscopy. But to look more closely at the fluorescence increase, so here in red, you could see the fluorescence increase over time as the nanotubes go in for the cell periphery. In black, you also see the fluorescence at the center increasing. And in blue is a background, we see a stable background. And what's interesting is that when you see the fluorescence at the periphery increasing, eventually it starts to level off. On the other hand, while it's leveling off, the fluorescence at the center just continuously to increase, continues to increase. So what this tells us is that when we see the increase at the center of the cell, it's not because of the 
periphery, the so when you have the nanotubes coating the outside, it's not because of the contaminating fluorescence of the outside, because otherwise you would see the same trend. But we see a different trend. So what this means is that the nanotubes are actually going inside. And this is actual increase due to nanotube fluorescence going inside and not only because of the fluorescence of the surrounding cell increasing as well. So we modeled this fluorescence. Uh, I won't go into too much detail with the model, but we assumed the two-step mechanism. We assume the nanotubes have a first step where it adsorbs to the surface and a second step where it goes inside. And we assumed mass action kinetic uh, rate laws. And we fit this model to the experimental data shown in red and black. And the best fit rate constants, so green is the model results, the best fit rate constants are shown here. And what we did is we compared these rate constants to what has been shown in the literature for mammalian cells to see if we could draw analogies between what's happening in a mammalian cell and what's happening in our cyanobacteria. We saw that the second step, the internalization step, the rate constant was about the same as what has been reported in the literature. But interestingly, the first step, the adsorption step, was much faster than what has been reported in the literature for mammalian cells. And this supports our hypothesis that we have a distinct uptake mechanism that's likely due to charge-charge interactions, whereas mammalian cells use a distinct uptake mechanism used on mechanisms such as endocytosis that, that these cyanobacteria cannot do. So in addition to looking at the tracking the fluorescence, the spatio-temporal distribution of fluorescence over time, we also were able to verify they went inside using ferrous cyanide. So ferrous cyanide, is a, uh, a redox molecule and what it does is it causes nanotube fluorescence to quench. The thing about ferrous cyanide is that it can penetrate the outer membrane of a cell but it cannot penetrate the inner membrane of the cell. So in this case we see the nanotube fluorescence distribution shown here in black and when we add the ferrous cyanide in red you could see that the parts on the periphery, so this is the perimeter shown here, the fluorescence decreases but at the center we don't see a decrease. And this is because the ferrous cyanide can't go inside and it cannot quench the nanotubes that are at the center. So this also supports that there are nanotubes getting to the center of the cell. We also did TEM uh, images here. So in black, we labeled it with these uh, gold nanoparticles. And we saw that the nanotubes, because the nanotubes cannot be easily seen in the TEM, we had to label it. We saw that they go inside and, and red arrows here also point to other nanotubes inside. And we also use confocal Raman spectroscopy. So Raman um, allows us to detect the nanotubes. The resolution is much lower than what we see with fluorescence, but nonetheless, we saw a higher signal near the cell center indicating that the nanotubes do go inside of the cell. So now that we know that the nanotubes go inside of the cell, we're trying to understand what is the mechanism? Um, do they use type 4 pili? So usually these cytic assisted cells that we use have these pili. So I mentioned certain uh, um, cyanobacteria can naturally take up DNA. And we initially thought that the same mechanism that is used to take up DNA will also be used to take up the nanotubes. So this mechanism is based on pili that extend outside of the cell and retract and bring in the DNA. So what we did is we compared nanotube uptake for these cells for we bioengineered cells that uh, mutants that does not have these pili. And if this mutant can take up the nanotube, then that means that the nanotube uptake is independent of the presence of this pili. And surely enough, you could see the nanotube fluorescence here, and you could see the autofluorescence of the cell, and they overlap. And so we were able to see that these cells, even though they lack the pili, they can still take up the DNA. Similarly, we saw nostoc cells. So these are other cells that lack these pili, and they also take up the, the, the nanotube. And so what this means is that we do not need pili in order to take up the nanotubes, and the uptake mechanism is independent of the presence of these pili. And what's interesting about these nostoc cells, you see they look a little different. So usually Seneca cystic cells are unicellular, nostoc cells form these nice long filaments. And so even though these cells are attached to one another in a filament, they're still able to take up the carbon nanotube. And this has exciting implications for, for example, if you wanna do a DNA uptake in these cells, which are also more difficult to transform. So now that we know that the nanotubes are going inside of the cell, we know that we could control the uptake by controlling the length of the nanotube, control the uptake by controlling the wrapping of the nanotube and we know that the uptake mechanism is not in, is not dependent on the pili we want to know what exactly are these nanotubes doing to our cells are our cells being hurt are they losing photosynthetic activity fortunately we saw that the nanotubes are still the cells are still able to do photosynthesis even when they have these nanotubes inside of them so here you can see the light is turned off the light is turned on the light is turned off 
and we see an increase in the oxygen evolution rate as light is turned on, confirming that we're getting photosynthetic activity. We also looked at the rate of photo uh, oxygen rate, so we compared the wild type cells to the cells with the nanotubes and even the cells with just lysozyme. And we saw in all cases, we see about the same level of oxygen production. And as a control, we have nanotubes without bacteria and media without bacteria, and we see no oxygen production. So what this means is that the nanotubes, when we put them with the cells, we don't see any decrease or negative effect on photosynthetic activity. In addition to photosynthetic activity, we want to know, are, do these cells remain viable? Can they still reproduce? Can they still divide? And this is a real-time movie where we could we have these nanobionic cells and we image them and you could see that they're actually continuing to divide over time. So the nanotubes do not inhibit this uh, division. And if you look closely, as they're dividing, you'll see some cells become much brighter than other ones. And the ones that are brighter are actually cells that are not dividing. And so we're able to differentiate between cells that are able to divide and cells that are not dividing just by the nanotube fluorescence intensity because they're much brighter when they're not dividing. And also the uh, paper goes into detail that we started to track these um, the cell division and we saw that the nanotubes, when they when the cells divide, they tend to stay in the original membrane fragment and they don't go in the new fragment. So you would see after cell division, a cell that has part of its membrane fluorescent in the near infrared and part of it not. And that fluorescent part is the part that it inherited from its parent. And so you could track through the generations where the membrane goes this so for example you can check this portion of the membrane is from the great great grandparent of the cell so it has exciting implications to be able to to see and study membrane division over time throughout several generations and finally so now that we know that the nanotubes can be used for imaging applications uh, we're excited to see if it could be used for photovoltaic applications so Photovoltaics are researchers who have already tried to use bacteria for photovoltaic applications. They put them on an electrode. And unfortunately, you know, I'd be lying to you if I told you you could go in your back, backyard, put these um, bacteria on your electrode and you have a photovoltaic cell. You actually get something with really low efficiencies if you're lucky. And that's because these bacteria, the outer membrane is actually insulating. They haven't been engineered by nature to behave as a photovoltaic cell. They're not naturally available as such. And so the idea is, can we use nanotubes to overcome this barrier to help make the, the outer membrane more permeable to electron transfer? So these are measurements that were undertaken by Melania Rogente, a postdoc in my lab. So here we have just nanotubes. We don't see a significant light response. The cynic assisted cells shown in green, we turn the light on, we see a floor, um, light response, turn the light off, uh, see a decreasing photocurrent. And then when we add the nanotube, we see a substantial increase in photocurrent. So the nanotubes were able to enhance bioelectricity generation from these cells. And we saw that uh, this bioelectricity generation was actually concentration dependent. So as we increase the nanotube concentrations, we see an increase in the amount of current that we get when the light is turned on. And so we try to understand what exactly, what role are these nanotubes doing in trying to, in increasing the electricity generation. So we took images of the cells shown here. This is without the nanotubes. This is with the nanotubes. And we saw that the nanotubes form this sort of filamentous mesh that kind of, that connects the cell intimately to the surface. We did additional measurements that confirmed that the nanotubes help decrease the resistivity of the electrode. So it allows it to more readily extract the electrons from the, uh, from the cell. We also confirmed the formation of this network through uh, fluorescence imaging. So this is a bright field image. This is a fluorescence of the cells, and this is a nanotube fluorescence. And we compared the images for lysozyme nanotubes. So these are nanotubes that we know go inside of the cell to DNA wrap nanotubes that we know don't go inside of the cell. In both cases, we saw the formation of this network. And interestingly, in both cases, we did see an increase in photocurrent. But because we saw a much higher increase in photocurrent with the lysozyme wrap nanotubes compared to the DNA nanotubes, we believe that the nanotubes are doing more than just interfacing the outside of the cell to the electrode. It's also doing something in terms of extracting electrons from inside of the cell to outside of the cell. And we were able to confirm this with additional measurements where we use a photosynthetic inhibitor. So we found that when we inhibit photosynthesis, we get less current. So we know that the electrons that we're extracting were actually coming from inside the cell and they were coming from photosynthesis. So that's just a brief overview. Uh, there was a lot going on in that paper, but I tried to digest the key points. 
uh, we were able to get nanotubes inside of the cells. We saw both a charge and link dependent uptake. We saw that when they're inside the cell, we have sustained viability and photosynthetic activity. And we were able to use the near infrared fluorescence of the nanotube to track the cells as they're dividing over several generations. And the daughter cells were actually able to inherit the near infrared fluorescence of the carbon nanotubes. And finally, we saw that the nanotubes were able to also enhance the electricity generation of these bacteria, enabling our, our vision for the living photovoltaic. So this is all work that's done by a very talented group at EPFL. I mentioned Melania and Alessandra uh, led in China in the photoelectrochemical measurements and getting the nanotubes inside the cell. And really the team just works in a very interdisciplinary interface. Um, they work together to be able to complement each other and offer different perspectives in the field. And I think that's a big strength of, of our community. I'd like to thank you for, for listening in and um, I guess uh, open the floor to questions. Igna van de Vosche, I'm not sure if I pronounced it well, but uh, Igna, please, the stage is yours. Hi, hi, everybody. Inga is fine. Uh, thank you. I also have to say thank you so much for presenting your work. It's super interesting to see like people push the boundaries between synthetic biology and materials, and it's an area that I'm super interested in as well. Um, I had a few questions regarding the system and how it could be put in the real world, I guess, um, and also how um, because I think maybe um, we were having a very inter interesting discussion and credits to Kenny Timi, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, for bringing up another type of um, cyanobacteria that he was looking into. So perhaps the first question would be, why did you specifically choose this strain as opposed to, sorry, I wrote down the word, electrogens? I'm not sure I had never heard of them, but it sounds very exciting, um, which are naturally charged cyanobacteria so to choose a different organism that has a higher charge in itself if you want it to be uh conductive for solar cells to also have like both the energy harvesting and then also the energy transmission so like a two-in-one system i guess that was the first question and then the second question was going to be um if these are going to be on roofs is it like a biofilm is it flat is it in a volume is it in a container is it going to be heavy on the roof um, I guess that's more of a very like large scale engineering question. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So actually the first question on the electrogens, you're thinking in the same direction we are. Um, so the reason why we first started off with cyanobacteria, so there are some other photosynthetic organisms that might be more, um, might produce more charge naturally. The reason why we went with Seneca cystis is because we actually have, is for the long-term vision. Uh, what our lab does that's a little different from most of the nanomaterials and nano to photophysics lab is we actually do bioengineering. And from it, Sinica cystis is actually kind of the E. coli of cyanobacteria. Um, it's the microbe that's easiest to genetically uh, engineer. It has a lot of uh, synthetic biology toolbox. It's usually one that's easier to get DNA inside. That's why we had to do the control measurements where we wanted to know if it was a, the DNA mechanism getting it inside. Um, so this is why we work with Sinica cystis, which is not necessarily the one that actually produces the most electricity. But considering that, you know, we have a lot of bioengineering to go and the we haven't even started to approach the limits of, you know, the efficiencies we could get with these devices, whether we're starting off at 1% or 1.2% efficiency, um, we felt that the advantages of working with a system that's more amenable to bioengineering was great. And actually that, um, that uh, risk took uh, paid off. So you, there's uh, electrogens, but there's also a series of microbes called exoelectrogens. So has anyone here heard of um, Shawanella or Geobacter before? Yes, Geobacter. So yeah. I see some heads. So Geobacter, we've heard, and I see some people nodding their heads. Um, so these microbes, what's really neat is that they produce electricity naturally. They don't do photosynthesis. They oxidize waste, uh, organic materials, and they have electro proteins that allow them to export electrons. And when you talk about electrogens, those were the, the microbes that came to mind. And what we started to do is we start to express those proteins in Sinica cystis. So we took advantage of the fact that Sinica cystis can be bioengineered. And we took the advantage of the fact that there are microbes that can export electrons much better than any cyanobacteria. And we started to do couple the two and start engineering cyanobacteria that can produce electricity. 
Um, so we are going in the direction of improving exoelectrogenicity through so synthetic biology, and we chose synecosystis because it's much easier to bioengineer. Um, your question, your second question, how do we envision using this? So this, uh, originally the easiest way to do it, so there's already um, devices that use uh, uh, electricity and, and they usually work in solutions. So what I've seen so far is they have giant vats and they have bacteria working in it and they have the electrodes. And because our bacteria are using um, solar energy, it would actually, the correct configuration in those situations would be you'd have a, well, the optimized uh, configuration would be, you'd kind of have these tubes. And the idea behind having tubes and having these cyanobacteria going through these tubes is that you have a high surface area to volume ratio. So the tubes will be transparent. They allow the light to go through and you have an electrode inside. Um, in reality, though, when I had when we had initially thought about this cyanobacteria, I always thought of it as a re I think of, as you said, a biofilm. So the first implementation at the first level, what can be done today? If you say, what can we do today? I would say do the solution. And that's already been done for other microbes. And we have these tubes. What can we do in the future? The more efficient approach is to go in a solid state device using biofilms. Can we use because the biofilms take advantage that you could increase surface area over time. Now, for this particular technology, it's possible to get nanotubes to, uh, to, to have cyanobacteria grow on electrodes as a biofilm naturally. And it's possible to make a solid state device. And we're actually working already towards, um, so there's a mediator that kind of um, shuttles um, the protons from one side to the other side of this photovoltaic cell. Usually that's used as a solution. But what we're doing is we're borrowing ideas from solid state devices in the photovoltaic communities and start to use those mediators in our system as well. So we're, um, the long-term vision is to make a solid state device, um, to have the biofilms grow on the electrode. And the short-term vision is using a solution which can be done today, which they already do for other applications. I hope that answers your question. So, uh, so I guess there's the question on, uh, is there a path to commercialization and as part of that, have you considered the sort of um, uh, containment, sort of biocontainment strategies within that path to commercialization? So uh, there is a path to commercialization. To be honest, so in our lab, we always have an eye towards commercialization. Um, so we wouldn't likely pursue something if it's just, you know, this kind of project is just for, for fun, actually. So the path to commercialization is kind of what drives us. Of course, there's a lot of research to get there. Um, but the numbers and efficiencies are quite promising. Um, in terms of containment, so we also thought about the idea of what if these bacteria go out of hand? We have release them in nature and they take over the world. Um, and of course, you know, so actually in this case, this is where evolution comes in and is quite handy. There's a reason why bacteria, the outer membrane is actually insulating. They're uh, actually the ba bacteria are uh, engineered to keep all the energy they need and then whatever energy they don't need, they dissipate. And so if these were to be released out in the wild, they would have to compete against bacteria that have evolved over billions of years of evolution and have already been optimized for that environment. So these bacteria were specifically engineering them to survive on an electrode. They need an electron sink. Once they leave the electrode, they're no longer competitive with the natural bacteria because they're losing energy. every you know, photon they take in, they might lose an electron, whereas these non-engineered bacteria um, are much more competitive because it keeps the energy more efficiently. So we're not, I'm not so concerned at this point in terms of these bacteria taking over natural bacteria because I don't think they're as adapt in the natural environment. They're adapted to work well in our artificial environment, which is in a photovoltaic. Uh, do you plan to generically engineer these strains or uh, there is no need or, or vision for yeah. engineering. That's exactly uh, the path we're headed towards. And in, in fact, we've already um, genetically engineered the strains. Maybe another journal club we could go over once this paper comes out. Uh, so that's exactly the, the vision that we have is genetically engineering them to produce more electricity. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Dr. Borkosian, for such an incredible presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the potential you see for this for the use of carbon nanotubes as semiconductors um, to actually produce a fuel from this as opposed to electricity. Because if you're using 
I assume photosynthesis, which is water oxidation to potentially produce hydrogen. Um, how would you see applications of that? Because on the artificial level, this was something that there's a lot of research about. But um, on the, I guess, synthetic biology level, how do you see this as a feasible possibility? Efficiency wise, would this be comparable to producing electricity, a current? Um, do you have any insight? So I missed a part of what you said. So using uh, the semiconducting carbon nanotubes to produce electricity directly, was that the question? To produce, so for example, to conduct the electron, the electrons released from the, the water oxidation reaction to produce hydrogen fuel oh. as opposed to electricity. Yeah. Oh, you guys are, are should be joining our group meeting. So that's actually, uh, so the hydrogen, the so right now we've focused only on the anode, which is getting the electrons out. And we've completely ignored what happens on the other side. And usually what happens is when you get an electron out, you get a hydrogen out. And so that hydrogen goes to another electrode, the cathode, to produce, hydro, uh, to produce hydrogen gas. So usually that um, cathode requires its own engineering. So we haven't officially touched that yet. Uh, I have a PhD student who in the next week will be defending his candidacy exam on how we can take those hydrogen. So and the techniques we, we uh, have approached are ne do not necessarily uh, rely on carbon nanotubes. Uh, the first approach is we're going to use whatever people have already done in the community. So we're not going to use biomaterials. We just want to be able to see if we could get hydrogen generation using existing materials. And then we're going to start going into trying to engineer this electrode as well. Uh, so the answer is yes, we're interested in that. So far, our ideas don't involve carbon nanotubes for the electrode. Um, it uses other light harvesting materials that have so far been shown a uh, great promise for hydrogen evolution. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ardemis, and thank you, Anna Malie, for such a wonderful question. Um, Sandra, I know that uh, there is another question on the queue, but unfortunately, we, we need to wrap up. So um, what I'm going to ask you, Ardemis, is if, if there is a way to contact you, I'm sure if through social media or your email, please drop it on the chat because I know that there's people curious to learn more about your research. And, and we have a lot of bright young people that uh, might be interesting also on following um, similar paths for, for research, so. Yeah, uh, and thank you all for the questions, actually. I'm sorry for the long responses because these are questions actually that we've been thinking about for many years. And so I have a lot to say, so they're very insightful um, and, and I appreciate it. And yeah, I wish you all the best on, on, on your journey, uh, wherever you end up in the synthetic biology world. It's a booming place and I'm really glad to see so much interest in the area. Thank you so much for them. It's, uh, it's, it's been very um, illuminating for, for us as, as a community to have your, your presence here sharing us this uh, cutting edge technology that you are working on at EPFL. Um, Sarah, any last comments before we wrap up? Just uh, thank you so much for this um, presentation and um, looking forward to the more research. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day and let's stay connected, uh, interacting through Racing the Clock and the Valley DAO. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Artemis. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye.